Hello and welcome to the second part of the second lecture on this course on chemical process design. This part of lecture two starts with the topic that was the main philosophy underlying the first lecture, which wasn't how to draw certain engineering diagrams, but in a more abstract sense, the importance of good, clear communication. This is all the more vital when conversation takes place between people working in different disciplines, as is incredibly common within chemical engineering. So, are you sitting comfortably? Yes? Good. Well, let's begin with a true story. This true story concerns the manufacture of pharmaceutical products, and it takes place in the offices in this pharmaceutical company, and the two protagonists are a chemist and a chemical engineer. The chemist has done all the original R&D work that concerns the synthesis of this pharmaceutical product. The engineer now wants to go ahead and start to design the pilot plant with which this pharmaceutical will be produced on an industrial scale. And so the conversation to's and fro's and reaction conditions and so on and so forth are being discussed. And the chemist basically says something along these lines. OK, so we've got a batch reaction that we've done in the lab. Um, we obtained 100% conversion under reflux in hexane and that took 16 hours. So let's just stop and think a second. What we're going to do is take apart what the chemist has said, which is factually absolutely correct for the situation that he or she has been establishing in the laboratory. But we need to view it through the eyes of the chemical engineer. Because if we just take that statement verbatim, we're going to end up with a design that may well be very compromised. If, however, we've taken the time to understand what's actually being said, then we'll end up with a very good design. So bear with me and you'll see what I mean. So let's take apart the first thing that our chemist has said. They've said that we've got a batch reaction, 100% conversion has been attained, and it's been under reflux in n -hexane. So why would a batch reaction in the laboratory be refluxed under n -hexane? The answer to that question is temperature control. And so what happens in the R&D chemistry lab is that a solvent with a known boiling point is often boiled away. The flask is either submerged or the solvent's combined with the reacting mixture. And that constant temperature is achieved thanks to that boiling process. Now, this is something we would never, ever do on a plant. I mean, the volumes of flammable solvent involved would be, frankly, a safety nightmare, putting it mildly. And of course, we've got other ways of controlling temperature. We have PID controllers, we have heating systems. The other thing to be aware of, of course, is that boiling under reflux is all well and good. But if we're looking for very concise conditions, as we will be in the manufacture of a pharmaceutical, you've got to remember that your boiling point varies as a function of pressure. And of course, atmospheric pressure varies as a function of the weather. So here on the whiteboard, I've put a graph of the boiling temperature of n-hexane as a function of pressure. 100 kPa is roughly standard atmospheric pressure. 940, 950, okay, 95, 94, 95 kPa, sorry, is going to be typically what you'd expect on a stormy day in the UK when a low pressure system comes over. 104, 105 kPa is the atmospheric pressure you can expect in the middle of the summer when you've got a nice fine high pressure system established over the UK. And that means you've effectively got a three degree C difference in your boiling temperature for n-hexane. So we need to be very careful. So we know full well we wouldn't be achieving a constant temperature through a boiling solvent reflux on a plant. We've got temperature control systems, but what temperature is that control system set to? So the first question the chemical engineer should ask is, OK, what's the exact reaction temperature? So you take that statement, you interpret it, and you ask an intelligent question back. OK, so the first thing to establish when you see something being refluxed is, OK, what temperature was actually that reaction taking place at? Did you measure it? If so, what was it? Let's have a look at the reaction time. 100% conversion was attained after 16 hours. Now, if you ever see 16 hours, be very, very wary. Because if a reaction is put on to reflux overnight, you'll find that the time between 5 in the evening and 9 the next morning is 16 hours. It may be nothing to do with the kinetics of the reaction. It just happens to be the time span of the experiment 
And of course, if some analysis was done at nine o'clock that next morning, yes, a conversion will have been found. It doesn't necessarily say that 100% conversion required 16 hours. It just happened after 16 hours had elapsed. Two very, very different things. In this particular case, the pilot plant design went ahead without questioning the exact time for that reaction. And the pilot plant was incredibly compromised because investigation after the construction found that equilibrium had actually happened within 20 minutes. So, if you see 16 hours anywhere in a dialogue between a chemist and an engineer, you've got to think, oh, hang on a minute, does that mean that a reaction was put on overnight and analysed the next morning. So again, the chemical engineer's question should be, well, do you know the exact reaction time? Have you got any data, spectroscopic data or otherwise, to actually tell us how the reaction varies as a function of time? Not just that after 16 hours it was complete. So beware. When you communicate with other disciplines, you have to understand where they're coming from. And likewise, they have to understand where you are coming from. Ineffective communication at the most basic level can lead to great problems when it comes to design. So, the chemist's statement is the battery action for pharmaceutical X attains 100% conversion under reflux in hexane for 16 hours. The chemical engineer's translation of this is the battery action for pharmaceutical X reaches equilibrium in 20 minutes at a temperature of 69 degrees C. Don't forget that. OK, so let's think about reactors. You will have already, by this point in your chemical engineering education, sat quite a few reactors courses. But let's recap a few key essential things that you will have learnt. First of all, when designing a reactor system, the reaction path, the stoichiometry, the conversion, the selectivity and the yield, along with the presence or absence of byproducts, the presence or absence of parallel reactions, or whether your reactions take place in consecutive series reactions, is absolutely fundamental. So point number one is understand your chemistry. Talk to your chemists, make sure you understand them, they understand you, and fundamentally you have a very, very good grasp of the chemical reactions that are going on in your system. If your reaction happens to be equilibrium limited, don't forget you can manipulate the position of equilibrium by exploiting Le Chatelier. So you saw in your process synthesis course earlier this term that, for example, you can play games around changing temperatures, adding inerts, removing products, adding excess feeds to manipulate that equilibrium position to try and get as much out of the reaction as possible. Your reaction temperature. It's a compromise. It's a compromise between safety, product degradation and speed. So increasing temperature increases your kinetics. Great. Fine. Increased kinetics means smaller reactor volumes. Great. Fine. Smaller reactor volumes are inherently safer than larger reactor volumes. But depending on the nature of your chemical system, lower temperatures may be inherently safer than higher temperatures. And so you've got a quantitative safety case to work up to figure out what is the best way to do this. You've also got to remember that higher temperatures can lead to product degradation and they can also promote side reactions and unwanted byproducts over the key product that you're aiming to synthesize. So the reaction temperature is going to be a compromise, but make sure that compromise has been set in an intelligent way. Liquid phase reactions are preferred to multiphase reactions. In multiphase reactions, interphase mass transfer can be the rate limiting step. Please don't forget this. This is why we're going to be talking about multiphase reactions in this lecture course. You may well be very used to looking at a set of chemistry, to looking at the kinetics, to then working out what reactor volume the kinetics imply. If you're in the multiphase world, that may be irrelevant because the entire system might be subject to mass transfer limitation and it is the mass transfer that is going to determine your reactor volume. So keep an open mind when you've got multiphase systems as to what is exactly the rate limiting step. Your reactor pressure. Again, this is a compromise. And safety here features greatly because if you're in the gas phase, higher pressure equals higher concentration, which means faster rates, which means smaller volumes, smaller residence times. However, higher pressures mean higher explosion energies and 
far less inherent safety. And so where you set your pressure for a gas phase reaction is pretty critical. In the liquid phase, you'll often set your reactor pressure to prevent vaporization, or maybe to allow controlled vaporization, because you may be exploiting the Chatelier again. You might want to vaporize unwanted volatiles to get your equilibrium position manipulated, or on the other hand, you just might want to ensure that everything stays in the liquid phase and you don't have a vapor phase to contend with. And of course, setting your pressure slightly higher may allow that to be achieved. So think very carefully how you're establishing your reactor conditions and importantly, why they're being established in that way. Now, if you are in the multiphase world, as can very often be the case, you've got additional complications to think about. So let's consider some key multiphase systems and think about their applications and think about some of the problems. So you might have a gas solid system. This could be, for example, a catalytic synthesis. If you look at the ammonia process, your catalyst is solid, all your reactants in the gas phase, and of course you've got all your different mass transfer steps between bulk gas to catalytic site and from catalytic site back to bulk gas. So are your kinetics limiting this? Or are your various mass transfer processes limiting this? You've got to always think about those processes. You've got also adsorption processes. You've got desorption. You've got diffusion of species. So you've got all these different mass transfer links between bulk gas and catalytic site. What's actually limiting? You might have a gas liquid system. Very often you might find you have oxidation reactions going on. You might have air bubbling through things. You might be dissolving soluble gases. A very topical one would be carbon dioxide. If you've got a carbon dioxide scrubber and you're trying to dissolve carbon dioxide into, say, an amine solvent, well, what's happening with the mass transfer gas to liquid here? So you other have, you've, your other complication here is often the presence of a two-phase flow. So what's happening in terms of the hydraulics of this system? Have you flooded it? Are you effectively blowing all your liquid out of your reaction vessel? You shouldn't be, but you need to make sure that you're not. So you might also find you've got a liquid solid system. Now, liquid solid systems have unique problems of their own because if you think about things like dissolving salts for, say, neutralizing acids or some other catalytic reactions where you might have a solid catalyst in liquid, you've got to make sure that solid doesn't settle out. So you've got, again, from a reaction standpoint, mass transfer between liquid phase and solid phase. But from a hydraulic standpoint, you've got the chemical engineer's bane of blockage. If your solids drop out of suspension, they're going to settle out in the area which has got the most stagnant liquid flow, which might well be the end of a flange that's been valved off or other pipe stubs, or it just might be in an area of poor circulation in the vessel. And very soon what you end up with is a nice liquid phase sitting above a solid that has completely blocked the system up. And so from an operation standpoint and from a maintenance standpoint, it can be a nightmare. So again, good design here will prevent that from happening. You may be incredibly lucky and have a combination of all of the above. You could have a liquid solid gas system, for example, something like catalytic hydrodesulfurization involves both solid, liquid and gases. So if you have one of these liquid solid gas systems, not only have you got the hydraulic problems of flooding and the problems of solid settling out and blocking, and you've also got those mass transfer problems as well. This case, which is a rate limiting step, is it gas to liquid, gas to solid, solid to liquid? In this lecture course, we're primarily going to look at gas liquid systems, this lecture, and liquid solid systems, next lecture. So let's recap a few key points. The first and most important thing is understand your data. And if you're working in a multidisciplinary environment, make sure that you can communicate with your colleagues effectively and that you understand them and that they understand you. Also, make sure that you're familiar with previous courses on single phase reaction engineering, because we're going to take that as assumed knowledge when we talk about multi-phase systems.